Welcome to System Update, I'm Mortiz Hussain filling in this week for Glenn Greenwald. Over the past few months, as you probably noticed, COVID-19 has become essentially the background music to all of our lives. All the challenges and all the opportunities we faced before are still there, but the virus has introduced a new variable that is likely to be with us for years to come. There are three components to our current situation. There's the challenge of the disease itself, the economic changes wreaking, and finally the social and cultural transformations and battles that we see playing out in real time. It's that last component that I'd like to focus on today. On today's episode of System Update, I have two people from different sides of the political spectrum talking about how they see COVID-19 changing culture and changing the way that people interact with each other in the years to come. Our first guest on System Update is Nesreen Malik, author of the forthcoming book in the United States, We Need New Stories. Nesreen, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Nisreen, the first thing I want to ask you is, in your book, you identified six cultural trends which existed even before the pandemic and perhaps have been exacerbated now that we're in the midst of the pandemic and the cultural changes it's wrought. Can you briefly walk us through the thesis of your book and the six trends that you identified? Sure. Um, so the thesis is that there are uh, several overarching myths uh, that have been running through our political discourse for a very long time that have corroded um, our societies and our political systems. Uh, and these myths masquerade as certain themes. Um, there are several of them, but I chose the six that I think are the most corrosive and the six that I think are uh, most uh, prevalent right now since 2016 in the UK and in the US since the election of Donald Trump and Brexit. I felt like these were the themes that really began to rear their heads. And they are broadly the, the subject of all these myths is that we are doing better than we think we are actually performing. Um, there's, there's a sense in Anglo-American society that there is a sort of exceptionalism and a good performance generally and a patting ourselves on the back. Um, and these are areas in which I think we we are seriously underperforming, um, and they are the myth of gender equality, uh, that there is a political correctness crisis, which there isn't. There's been one going on since 1960s, allegedly, uh, that there is a free speech crisis, uh, and we see that rehashed over and over again, most recently with the whole council culture debate. Um, the uh, fourth is that we have a uh, infrastructure, a media infrastructure that is reliable and unbiased. Um, and the fifth is that we have a history that is uh, something that we can be proud of, whether it's colonialism in the UK or uh, sort of post-slavery civil rights movement uh, in the US, um, and broadly that we have um, an, a sort of an issue with identity. Identity politics is bad, that the way identities organize themselves to achieve political equality is fracturing of common causes, um, when actually the most serious identity politics and the most dangerous is white identity politics. So bro these are the six specific themes, but the overarching um, myth that kind of underpins them all uh, is that the status quo, the establishment is fine, uh, and any attempts that try and uh, amend it or uh, garner more rights from it are movements that are vandal, sort of vandal movements, thug movements, uh, movements that are asking for too much or going too far. We hear that a lot. Um, and the book tries to explain how all these excuses, we call them tools, how these tools discredit movements for social equality. So, you know, the British version of the book came out already, and the U.S. version is scheduled to come out later this year. So in the intervening period, there's been this massive change in the social structure, economic structure in the United States and across the West and across the world. And it initially started as a public health crisis. It rolled into an economic crisis, which we're still in. And there's also a political and social upheaval, which was began in the United States, with the, triggered by the killing of George Floyd, and really expanded throughout the West and beyond, in fact. And many of the themes you just identified have in some sense been amplified by this crisis. And we've seen many pent-up conflicts, 
come to the fore uh, regarding, as you said, quote unquote, class cancel culture, uh, cultural disputes over identity politics. How have you seen the pandemic amplify these debates? And what may we see going forward as these conflicts have somewhat been initiated or brought to the fore by these events? That's a good question. So I think the main thing that the pandemic amplified is the sort of existing inequalities that we were told were not that serious, right? We were told that people of certain identities do not need to organize themselves on the basis of identity because all that matters is that, you know, we find universal common economic causes, for example. And it became very clear with the way the pandemic disproportionately affected Black and ethnic minority populations across the West, that it is a very racialized inequality. Um, and this view that Black people should not try and organize themselves along the lines of Blackness, because Blackness is less relevant than, for example, class, has, has been exposed as a complete lie, because Blackness is a determinant of where you're going to sit in the social structure, in the economic structure, whether you're a key essential worker, whether you can work from home. Um, and so it has exposed that sort of, the, the myth primarily that identity politics is an indulgent sort of preoccupation of youth and like woke culture, basically. Um, so that's, that, that's the most important uh, sort of subterranean Fisher that people have been talking about for a long time and been trivialized and kind of dismissed. Um, and it's just been so stark that there is a very clear overlap between uh, one's racial background and how susceptible that person is to um, catching coronavirus because the kind of work they do, the kind of places they live, and also the, 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 the kind of healthcare access that they have. So that's the first thing. The second thing that I think has been fascinating, which is, which is a thesis that I made in the in the British book when it first came out, is that the reason why all these myths are necessary is because the system is actually very weak, right? The kind of the status quo, the establishment, the powers that be are actually very weak. They're holding on to power via populism via sort of posturing about immigrants, about minorities, about Mexicans and all that kind of stuff. It's not built on any sort of real ideological or class uh, commitment. And so the only way it can extend its, its life is by kind of intensifying these lies about the danger of change, right? It's to make change, it's to frame demands for equality as the sort of threat to stability. Um, and what has become clear, actually, since the pandemic, is that that system is incredibly weak, and that once these stories about the danger of identity politics, the danger of racial uh, movements, the danger of kind of street protest, all of these things have been exposed as not only necessary, but super effective, right? They're not actually movements that vandalize, they're not movements that destroy, their movements have actually built quite a lot. And so it's kind of an, I, I think it's produced a negative thing, which is which is actually exposed the extent of racial disparity and how that exposes us to illness and death and kind of lack of equitable healthcare. But it has also exposed the fact that these lies, these myths are necessary because the system is so weak that it can only exist via this sort of propaganda. And once the propaganda is... Uh, is dispelled, change actually comes about extremely quickly because the core of the system is quite rotten. Mm. You know, you make a very interesting point about the debate over race and class in terms of organizing for social change. And especially in the United States on the left, it's a very uh, intense debate at the moment. And can you talk, tell me, you, you said that historically there are patterns that are repeat themselves today. Can you say how this debate has been replicated in the past and what parallels you see between what was said now and then? Because a lot of people are grappling with this and they don't know where they come down, but to put it in historical context would be very useful uh, so we can understand the arguments we're hearing from both sides at the moment. Yeah, so so I would just, it'd be good to zoom up, zoom back a little bit, zoom out a little bit, and just sh explain where the term identity politics comes from. Uh, so it was by a movement, it, it first appeared 
um, uh, in the text of a movement called the Combahee River Collective, uh, which was a group of black women that decided that for them to advance their causes, they need to organize around their identity. But it was very much seen as a, a, a way of, of uh, campaigning that interlocked with other identities, right? So the whole origin of identity politics was intersectional, right? That it was supposed to be a coalition of different identities that were all oppressed or all undermined or marginalized by a system that picks them off uh, or sidelined them because of their identity. It was never meant to be a balkanization, right? It was always a kind of 1960s, 1970s movement of interlocking identities, whether it's gender identity, uh, sexuality, race, all of these things were meant to be kind of one coalition in an anti-establishment rights eliciting movement. So, and, and immediately, the moment it came into being, this is a theme that constantly recurs, I found in these myths, the moment these movements for equality begin, they're immediately attacked, immediately framed as uh, asking for a special dispensation, right? So in the 60s, and the 70s, the first thing in the United States, uh, people who campaigned for equal rights for gay and bisexual people, for women, for uh, racial minorities, was that you are asking for a special treatment. And it's selfish, and you need to look at what we need as a whole, as a society. Now, this is a very powerful, and, and, and why this is why it repeats, it's powerful because people on the right and the left agree on it. The right and the left hate identity politics for very different reasons. The right because identity politics is a very powerful way of expressing uh, grievance and it really points out like the very real um, inequalities and, and fractures that exist when there is a right-wing government because it tends to be quite hierarchical. And the left hates identity politics because it's very hard to hold on to identity. It's very hard to kind of create uh, momentum and get a critical mass of support based on identity because not everyone shares the same identity. So the left is obsessed with e economics because you can build a broad coalition based on class or economic deprivation. The left kind of finds it hard to imagine that you can actually just interlock all these identities together using an economic uh, undergirding. So this is the, the left and the right have always attacked identity politics while failing to see how the major advances for the Democratic Party in the US only came about because it managed to convert a significant chunk of minority votes to go to the left. Um, and so th this is how these patterns are being reproduced. Now, there was a, a period, uh, I would say, from the kind of Bush administration to the end of the Barack Obama administration, where identity politics was seen as dormant, right? It became, it was very obvious what was happening. Black and ethnic minorities and immigrants were broadly Democrat um, and the rest were broadly Republican. And then after the Barack Obama administration, when, when Trump was elected, the left was kind of blindsided by the fact that so many white people voted for Trump and because they hate identity politics, the only way they could conceive of it was that it was because the left spent too much time fixating on immigrants, immigration, identity politics, and ignoring and dismissing and not taking care of white people when that was actually completely false. Um, what it did was make overtures without any serious infrastructure or politics to back it up, and actually black people turned off the Democratic Party, and that's one of the reasons why they lost, not because they lost white people. And so over the past 40, 50 years, as identity has kind of waxed and waned in importance uh, in political discourse, it has always been used by both political parties to convert votes, um, but at the same time has been always maligned as a pointless way of garnering uh, votes. Now, one final point is that as we fixate on how the left needs to win over or lose white voters and how it dismisses uh, uh, black and ethnic minority voters, white identity politics has been extremely efficient, 
over this period of time. It has a whole playbook. White, uh, white politicians know very well how to uh, dog whistle to their white voters that this vote is about race, it's about status. And so one of the theme, one of the big themes in the book is that the way we talk about identity politics has been a massive distraction and diversion from where what I call aggressive identity politics is happening, which is white supremacist politics. But we don't see it because it's the default, right? It's the norm. Um, and so it, it, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a diversion, basically, from the most potent, well-organized and uh, aggressive form of identity politics, which is white supremacy. You know, it's very interesting, um, especially in the United States, we're confronting this issue now, is that a society, you know, it, normally most societies in history have been diverse, ethnically or culturally. Homogeneity is really uh, the exception, and usually it's been accomplished through in the aftermath of great violence. But there seems to be an assumption that some sort of homogeneity to national culture is the norm, which is not the case. But one thing that has served to sort of unite people across different divides is having a society where there are certain serviceable or relatively acceptable myths that people accept, and they serve as a basis for a shared national culture. And even the title of your book sort of gets at this, that we need new stories. It says we need new uh, stories that can unify a diverse array of people while not negating uh, their each individual experiences. I think African Americans are a very special case because their own existence in the country was in the United States was based on involuntary sort of uh, hegemony and submission to a predatory majority community. And a lot of the heroes of American history, the mainstream American history, were very much villains in the African-American sense of history. And I think now, finally, people are reawakening to the incompatibility incompatibility of these two stories. Is it possible, and, you know, it's interesting, this, this uh, it's sort of like, it's very difficult because now this very extremely vexing question has come about right at the same time and perhaps in because of uh, the material collapse of American society economically uh, as a result of the pandemic. How do we go about creating a project where new acceptable myths or new stories are created that win the buy-in of a majority or supermajority of people? while not uh, creating a situation where we do have a sectarian conflict. Because there are white people in the United States, poor white people, who we need to have solidarity with. Because George Floyd also was poor, too. He was black, and also he had COVID-19, he was poor. And this is something that unites people, this negative experience, and uh, they need to challenge power to address that. Can we have acceptable histories which are shared by everybody, or does everyone have their own history, which necessarily is uh, some degree in conflict with one another? Again, a great question that I possibly couldn't possibly answer in the time that we have. Um, but I'll just I'll make broadly three points. One is you're absolutely right. Uh, I think it is uh, not only unrealistic, but not human uh, to pretend that we don't need these shared accounts. Right. That these shared, um, not necessarily myths, but uh, storified, basically histories that that bring us together. It's a, it's an important thing. We you know we are we are made of communities and we are organized, if not necessarily across the lines of nation state, but across the lines of sort of our neighbors and our family. And we need to have something, uh, if not shared between us, some sort of common touch points. Now, what has been done extremely effectively uh, in the United States is that. People of similar classes, of similar grievances have been split from each other uh, because one of those or a few of those people in those classes, few of those kind of demographic groups have been told that they are superior to other white people in that class. And if they only maintain their racial currency, that they will at least not be on the bottom rung. Um, and so what I talk about in the book is the fact that these myths actually hurt almost everyone, right? They're only beneficial to a small minority at the top of the Ponzi scheme that is myth-making. Um, and the way white supremacy works, for example, uh, is to treat whiteness as a sort of trust fund, a sort of currency that white people have that distinguishes them from black people, distinguishes them from immigrants, distinguishes them from like anybody else lower down the racial scale. So even though white people might not be thriving, 
there is at least the comfort of knowing that someone is beneath them. Um, and this kind of uh, status base, I mean, I mean, Isabel Wilkerson, whose book uh, has come out a few weeks ago, makes a very similar point about caste and how uh, race in the United States falls along the lines of caste and that caste is important because to for everyone to maintain their position, for, for society not to be restive and agitated all the time, for anyone to everyone to maintain their position in the pyramid, they have to be they have to know that they are better than someone else. And that's why and that's how race and racism is deployed to great effect in the United States, uh, because it has supplanted rational economic concerns um, and it has subordinated them to the kind of fake currency. You can't get anything out of, if you're a poor white person, you can't get anything with your white currency, right? If you're a middle-class person or upper middle-class person, perhaps. And so the second point I'd like to make is that for that, there is an account that can be written. There is a story that can be written that could galvanize the George Floyds of the world and the white working class voters of Trump of the world. But it has to be something that um, makes them recognize that they are both on the sharp end of a much more powerful system that only extracts from them and gives them nothing, right? And so it, that is essentially a, a very left-wing concept. And I think the issue in the United States is that our left-wing party uh, or the sort of nominally left-wing party, shall we say, uh, is is not prepared to make these kinds of arguments because they are seen as radical and they are seen as unrealistic and they are seen as sort of um, how can I put it? Um, what's what I'm looking for? But uh, hysterical or you know naive. All these sort of epithets and slurs that are thrown at the left uh, in the United States for making these for making these uh, attempts. So that's the second thing that needs to be done. The the, the kind of the currency of white supremacy needs to be exposed as mostly a fake currency that you can buy very little with for most people. It's just a hierarchy stabilizer for more powerful people above the food, uh, higher up in the food chain. Um, and the third thing that needs to be done is there needs to be a, a flipping of the script. And I've seen that happen with Black Lives Matter to my great surprise and joy since since the summer, since June, is that resistance and solidarity with blackness on the part of white people has become part of their wider politics. Before it used to be a sort of discrete chunk of a white person's politics, um, but there was research that was conducted early in the Black Lives Matter protests in June that showed that attitudes to Black Lives Matter on the part of left-leaning voters went from being a topic that they kind of leaned in and out of, depending on whether it was Ferguson or there were riots or there was a, a murder of a police murder of a black person, to becoming a constant part of their politics. So when they come to vote for someone, in addition to economics, foreign policy, healthcare and schooling, racial equality was a part of their politics as well. So I think to incorporate racial inequality, racial inequality as a part of white politics, because it harms white people too, uh, as it clearly has over the past four years, uh, then I think we're onto something. You know, it's so interesting. You mentioned it literally harms them economically too, because W.E.B. Dubois, sorry, W.E.B. Dubois mentioned the literal concept of the psychological wage, which is paid to lower class white people, whereas they are exploited and they are denied the economic benefits of the elite of their community, but they get this supplementary psychological status payment that okay, your status exactly. payment above this other group of people, regardless of whatever educational or economic achievements they have, you'll always have this one card which is innate and will give you some sort of uh, a payment in lieu of anything else. And it's been a very effective. It, I think 2016 was such an effective demonstration of that, that, uh, was, huge, huge. Yeah. And, and, and I'm, and I'm, like, I'm still shocked when people s still kind of try and push the economic anxiety angle because it was so clear in 2016 what happened. Um, even when, when I remember there's an interview that really stuck in my mind after the government shutdown in 2018, wasn't it? Um, 
and uh, government employees who were not being paid because of the shutdown, who had voted for Trump, one of them actually said, he wasn't supposed to do this to us. He was supposed to hurt other people. Uh, and this view that you can kind of parcel off the harm that happens uh, when you have a white supremacist uh, sort of based governance is nonsense because it, it kind of, it, inflict, it inflicts harm on the whole system. And there is also a whole thesis that a lot of the policies that are sold to white people or they're the preserve of white identity politics ultimately harm them. You know, gun culture is uh, claims a lot of, you know, is, is, is part of a certain kind of white right wing um, individualistic uh, politics that is very harmful to white people. Um, the sense that, you know, healthcare is something that people from poorer countries are going to come and benefit from stops white people from getting socialized health care. And so there is a sort of, in the book, I call it the boomerang effect of myths in that they kind of come back and harm everyone um, or almost everyone. Um, and, and that this fake currency of white supremacy is what stops people from seeing this boomerang effect because they're still not that guy. Right, right. You know, it's so interesting. I've kind of, after four years, it's been a little desensitizing with Trump, but you're right. In 2016, it was very hurtful, actually, that people voted for someone who, you know, at best was indifferent to the fate of uh, minorities and immigrants and at worst was actively hostile. It was in some sense an anti-establishment election because there was a left-wing candidate who was also very hostile to the status quo, but did not get as much traction, and ultimately the right-wing manifestation of it didn't just get traction, went all the way to the White House. And we've kind of gotten used to him being in office, but it's really not normal that he's in office. And it was, in many ways, the ultimate expression of uh, the poverty of, of the uh, psychological wage of racism because he's such a poor candidate. He's such, he did such a poor job. He didn't even pretend he was going to deliver on his promises, and he didn't deliver on them, except for some cruel promises of being hard on immigrants and so forth. And now he's in office and, you know, he may be reelected, he may not be, but he certainly moved the Overton window on what's normal or not. But really, it's not acceptable that it's not normal that it's happened. There should be a backlash. And, you know, there's two things I want to ask you. This one thing, you know, the system, the system, we are, the economic system we live in right now, it's gotten very addicted to giving out psychological wage payments. It's very tight fisted with economic wage, but it's willing to give status uh, payments to people as a way of quelling social discontent. And, you know, the protests which led to, which were triggered by the killing of George Floyd, 25 million people in the U.S. protested, many people around the world in Europe as well too protested. And there has not been a commensurate, as yet, there's not been commensurate economic or political changes reflecting the level of popular disenchantment with the system as it currently exists. But there's been a uh, bevy of cultural or symbolic changes which have been proffered by not just government, but maybe uh, corporations and so forth, because they've kind of gotten used to this. And they've used to this sort of mode of dealing with people, whereas in reality, people are really coming from a place, place of great pain and trying to get something more out of it. And George Floyd was a great example just because he suffered such the harsh effect of the pandemic in terms of the actual disease, the impoverishment, and uh, the harsh policing that he ultimately killed him. So uh, the two things I want to ask you are, number one, how is it possible to turn this movement into a systemic uh, way of extracting uh, serious concessions from the system as exists. And number two, you know, whenever there are these sort of uh, pushes for greater equality or greater either racial or economic or cultural and so forth, there's always a backlash. So what do you foresee happening now that we sort of cross this Rubicon and what does history tell us about what we may see in the future? Well, I'll answer the, the second question first. So when I first started thinking about this kind of stuff, when I first started writing the book, I was preoccupied with how to, how to, how to negotiate the backlash, right? How do you kind of prepare for it? How do you argue against it? Um, but it isn't even a backlash. It starts, it's a kind of contemporaneous lash, if that makes sense. A backlash suggests that 
a movement unfolds, people see the results, and then there is a response to it. But the way the establishment, which is a kind of, you know, slightly meaningless term, but basically entrenched interests, the way they work is when there is a challenge to them, they immediately respond. They don't wait and reflect and see. It's a kind of instinctive, um, almost mechanized response to, to to challenges. And you see it, you saw it happen in June, like all, all, the, all the tropes were rolled out straight away. Protesters were still on the streets and people were saying, it's vandalism, it's looting, uh, it's unrealistic, defunding the police, what are you talking about? Uh, sure, Black Lives Matter, but not this way. So the way to think about it isn't that it's a backlash. The way to think about it is that you, what you, the fight is the fight just continues, but the but the venues change, right? So even if you've managed to elicit some concessions, and I think the Black Lives Matter concessions have been significant. Uh, I sat down and wrote uh, an exhaustive list of what happened since June, and it's it's been a lot, huh? It's not just been like withdrawing Uncle Ben's rice or whatever. You know, it's been Confederate flags at NASCAR. It's been uh, legislation at the level of local uh, federal government. It's been police uh, camera changes. So a lot of things are happening. Um, so for, for us to think about how to negotiate the backlash, we have to think of it as a, 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 res a, a continued fight with the system. There is at no point when, when the establishment is challenged, at no point is there a moment where people are like, huh, that's interesting, tell me more, right? There is, that moment never comes. And so in, in a sense, there is no backlash. There is just a continuation of the means of counterinsurgency. And the first stage is discredit, dismiss, sneer at, uh, and the second stage is try and shut it down. And the third stage is kind of stall it and hope it goes away, right? And so a helpful way to think about it is that we just continue these fights wherever we can, right? It's not to kind of say, um, how, how do we try and convince people? How do we try and convince them and, and make them understand that this backlash is not warranted? It's going to happen. It happens from, from the moment the protest starts. And so the way I think about it is that, you know, if the protest is not on the streets anymore, it's in the office, it's in the workplace, it's in, the, it's in our daily lives. Um, and the chant is, I mean, it's, it's going to sound like slightly, slightly um, OTT, but it really is no justice, no peace, right? Like just keep agitating wherever you can, because the backlash exists and continues and will always be there, uh, whatever we do, no matter how many people we convince or how many people you bring along with you or how rational your arguments are or how polite your protest is, there is always going to be resistance. Um, and so my slightly hopeful prognosis is that the way change happens is that you convince some people, you force other people, you embarrass other people, and others just die off, right? It's just like, a, it's, a, it's a confluence of all these things happening at the same time. Mm. Uh, what was your first question? <laughs> oh, you know, actually, I feel like you answered the first question, too. That was excellent. Okay. And then you're Which is how you're, do we move on, right? How do we How do we, how do we institutionalize it? But yeah. you, you made some excellent points to that effect. And your thesis about the four or sorry, three possibilities of how people actually respond to it uh, it was very poignant. That's actually what I was thinking. I was wondering how that works, too, and that was a very eloquent exp explanation. So, you know, one thing I want to ask you, too, is you are very well-read on U.S. politics, but you're based in the U.K., and I'm very interested in the contrast, as you see it, between the environment in the U.K., uh, socially and sociopolitically and the same issues, and how it contrasts with that in the U.S. Because, you know, from a U.S. perspective, in some ways, the U.K. seems way more liberal, uh, you have certain institutions which are more liberal, like healthcare and so forth, that we, we describe as liberal. But in the other way, you have a very conservative culture in some ways, so a very entrenched culture, which is a lot older of a culture and more set in its ways than the United States, which is a much younger country. How do you see these social dynamics playing out differently in the two countries? And uh, what are the positive and negatives you see in comparison to the two? So the UK has become 
uh, was very different to the US. Um, it does have a welfare state, it has a public healthcare system, um, and it has a, more of a consensus on things in the US that are still con controversial, like, you know, abortion, same-sex marriage, all that kind of stuff, which have been broadly resolved to the left of center in the UK. Um, what they do share is two things. Uh, one is a deluded exceptionist view of their own history. Um, which continues to uh, bite them and, and kind of challenge the way we do politics today because there's a kind of complete divorce between the historical account of what Britain is and what America is um, and what they tell themselves it is. So in the UK, there is this view that empire and colonialism was this great civilized mission as opposed to a thousand years of, uh, of uh, oppression and white supremacy and extraction uh, from Africa and Asia. And that's creating a lot of social tension, but it also has created a lot of political adventurism because the British sometimes genuinely feel like they can do no wrong because they were so imperious for a long time. And, and Brexit, I think, is, a, is an expression of that. Um, and so they share this sort of largely unresolved um, an unconfronted problematic history that really clashes with their self-perception or how they sell themselves as these sort of fundamentally moral civilizing forces. Um, and it goes so deep that it's almost, uh, it's almost a pathology, I think, in, in the popular culture of the two countries. The second thing that they share, which is more significant, um, has been a relatively recent development in the UK, which is over the past, 10 years, the public sector has been gutted in the UK, and we are fast catching up with the United States uh, with the privatization, privatization of health healthcare, the corporatization uh, of the public bureaucracies of the country, and sort of outsourcing of the public space to private contractors. Um, and what has happened is an accelerated view of or an accelerated understanding of government as a body that provides no services, right? That does nothing but give you a sense of like status in the world. And what has happened, what, what took 50 years to happen in the US post Reagan took five years in the UK to happen. Um, and it happened and it, it was triggered primarily by the sort of decoupling of the state from the provision of services to the citizen. And once that happened, things began to fall apart very quickly. Uh, and the right and right wing governments, successive right wing governments in the UK became more and more posturing, more and more intellectually bankrupt, um, and more and more prone to do politics by big gestures, uh, populism, anti immigration, and Islamophobia, actually. Um, so the and then 2016 in this like horrible uh, sort of um, uh, twinning in the two countries cracked those systems wide open and we got uh, Brexit in the UK and Donald Trump in the US. Yeah, I think that what you just identified fighting against that the basically dis dissolution of society, the structural basis of it is one thing that unites it should unite people across different divisions and actually lays bare the real fault line there's the people in power who are trying to privatize with the common good of all of us and in doing so will leave us basically in a war against all as individuals which you know while we're still paying their taxes just uh, we're getting much less yeah. for it. and this is where coming back to the pandemic this is where i worry that uh after the sort of final stages of the pandemic are over and the economic, inevitable economic shock hits, what will happen is a deliberate stoking of these economic fault lines, right? What will happen is a, uh, a conversion of votes to right-wing governments by via scaring people that immigrants and outsiders are coming, are coming for their jobs, right? There is the sense that um, in economic in economic distress, it's very easy to turn people against each other, um, and we already have a very rich firmament uh, laid down for that 
kind of politics, that sort of um, politics of of deliberate um, uh, stoking of differences or exaggerated differences between people. And what worries me is that post pandemic, hopefully there is a post pandemic in the near future, that instead of all these things that we've realized over the past few months, you know, all these things about the kind of entrenched inequality, the fact that we are so vulnerable, so many of us are so vulnerable to uh, to illness uh, and and mortality because of the gutting of our public healthcare systems and the intellectual degradation of our governments to the extent that they could not organize a competent pandemic response in the kind of first and fifth largest economies in the world, instead of taking those massive epiphanies and moving with them and basically overthrowing these symptoms systems because they do not work, what we will get is a sort of um, establishment redux, right? Where it doubles down and it says to the its voters, the economy is tanking. There is only that many resources now and basically go fight for them. And it can just sit back and reap the electoral spoils of that. Nasreen, thanks for joining me. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. My next guest is Yair Rosenberg. Yair is a senior writer at Tablet Magazine. Yair, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. So, you know, COVID-19 is essentially a giant social experiment we're all going through in, together. Uh, we've had pandemics in the past, but this is the first pandemic we've had in the digital age. I want to get your opinion on what sort of cultural transformations we're seeing at the moment and how you interpret them in light of history. So we talk a lot about the political and economic implications of the pandemic, and there's been a lot of ink spilled on that subject. I don't think we've thought nearly as much about the social and cultural impacts uh, that it has had on people and their everyday lives, um, their way of working, their way of communicating. Um, I think that uh, people are actually profoundly disconnected from the way their lives used to work, the way their businesses used to work, uh, the way they used to work and interact with other people. Uh, and we're seeing effects of that all over the place, and we're not recognizing them as such. Uh, so when you look at, say, people notice that there have been a lot of uh, uprisings and conflicts um, in newsrooms um, and publications recently, and there are real, real difficult issues that are being hashed out in those conflicts, um, and they're very, very important ones. Uh, but you can't really separate uh, those expressions of uh, conflict from the live reality of journalists at the time, which is, you know, so journalists are disconnected um, from their normal processes and ways of working. So they're not living in an office, um, talking to each other, dealing uh, with the normal editorial processes. Uh, to give a very obvious example, think about the New York Times and that Tom Cotton op-ed that was so incredibly controversial and that they later said they could have done a better job with. Would they have done a better job if they had a normal editorial process of people working normally in an office, um, talking to each other? Um, I think yes. I think that that would have come out differently. And then to the extent that there would be a controversy and upset about the editorial being published, would the controversy about it have played out in the way it did, um, which is sort of purely online, uh, instead of people sort of just marching into Dean Beckett's office or people talking to their editors, right, and people organizing in the office and having real conversations about it, it probably would have played out very differently. I don't know what the result would have been or whether it would have had different consequences, but it seems pretty clear that once you move our entire you know, work setting and social setting to the internet, um, that you're going to see uh, very different ways of negotiating conflicts. And often something, I think, does get lost. Um, and you have to also keep in mind, especially in terms of newsrooms, that everyone is not just doing everything online. Everyone's also operating under tremendous amounts of anxiety and stress. Uh, because here we are, all of us, experiencing, I think, one of the worst periods for us in most of our lives. Um, certainly, if you're my age, this is the worst uh, thing that most people have ever experienced. And if you're a journalist, you're not even really allowed uh, during your work hours to look away from it or to distract yourself or to do something else because your job is to cover it and to pay attention to it and comment on it. And that is incredibly debilitating, right? So you're doing your job, right? And your job is soul crushing. And then you're also not able to see your colleagues face to face and work on things in your normal way. And then some, you know, and you're trying to juggle uh, massive 
uh, racial protests across the country and coverage of the pandemic, right, all while completely disconnected from your normal way of doing things. I'm not actually surprised to see newsrooms melting down. I'm actually surprised that more newsrooms haven't melted down under this sort of situation. You know, it's interesting. We see a lot of the uh, breakdown of newsrooms, for instance, as you mentioned, because they're highly visible to us as institutions because their whole job is to talk to the public. But I'm sure that this sort of breakdown in personal relationships, especially in uh, workplaces and even large families or small families, is being replicated across the country because we're all in a situation that we don't have the normal mitigating sort of social cues that uh, enable communication to happen smoothly. Like, for instance, if you're in a room with somebody, you shake hands, or there's a conveyance of tone, or even the physical presence of another person adds context to communication, which makes it a lot easier. And especially in cases where you're talking about political differences, which are very difficult to deal with, even in the best circumstances, they're heightened so much more. They become much more fraught than they normally are because we're speaking and communicating in totally decontextualized ways. You know, given the fact that we're all sort of sharing this experience of collective stress and this strange sort of black mirror type of effect where we're able to communicate but only in this very abnormal and sort of uh, unnatural format, is there a way we can communicate now with each other or continue the process of uh, political and cultural debate uh, taking into account the sort of shared experience we're all having right now, which makes it a lot harder to have those conversations? Yeah, I do think it starts from the very top. So people have large platforms. If you're a commentator, if you're a reporter, if you're a politician, if you're some sort of leader, um, you can model a certain type of uh, sense of shared experience and sense of grace towards people who are going through tremendously stressful experiences and just sort of recognizing the amount of strain that people are under, which doesn't mean compromising on the arguments you're making or the ideals you're putting forward. A very concrete example of this, there's a sort of discourse that surrounds, say, people going to bars, right, or people going to church or synagogue or wanting to celebrate with their families on Ramadan. Um, And you often see a very judgmental discourse on social media where people are like, wear a mask, social distance, how could you do this, look at this picture, so on and so forth. Um, you don't have to you know, think that that's wrong to realize that the way it's being done is probably not particularly effective, right? It is not speaking to people's real lived concerns, uh, which is to say that um, not being able to live the life you were living with the people you were living with is tremendously hard, whether it's meeting up with your friends at your favorite bar, right, or going to church. Uh, this is extraordinarily difficult, and we're asking people to live completely differently um, and in ways that are counter-social to their experiences uh, for like a year at least. Um, and it's really difficult. So what does it cost you to say, I totally understand how hard this is for you right, and how debilitating it must be for you. It sucks for me. Let me tell you about something I had to forego right, that was really, really hard for me. Um, And I totally understand why this is difficult for you, but I think, and here's why, that this is why you should be wearing a mask. This is why you should social distance. It's a totally different way of talking. It's hard to fit into 280 characters, right? And that's one of the problems that we face, but people should model this and model that sort of empathetic communication that recognizes we are all experiencing this together and we're sharing this experience together um, can really change the valence of the conversation. You know, I find it so interesting the meaning or the usage of media is evolving as we speak. The introduction of digital media in the last 10 years has all had all these downstream impacts, some positive, some negative, that we're still coping with at the moment. But I find that given the general hi- hyper-polarization of politics, uh, it's actually been, there's been a very strange personalization of media in the sense that you, know, you mentioned that there's a lot of talk about who's not wearing a mask, who's wearing a mask, whereas statistically, you know, all the statistics show that most Americans support social distancing measures, most of them support wearing masks, a very strong majority is in all senses. Most people are cooperating with the mandates which are necessary to mitigate the pandemic and hopefully get behind it. The government as a whole, given the resources it has to bear, has failed to control the pandemic in the way other countries have uh, around the world. And we're dealing with a very uncontrolled and unprecedented situation, a very painful situation for everyone living in the United States. But I find a lot of the media discourse is 
trying to treat this as a way of setting people against each other. Like, you know, those people over there are so stupid, they're not wearing a mask, or they don't believe in the virus. And not to say there are not any people like that at all, but, you know, the level to which these people exist, or which they're responsible for the situation, is being, in many ways, amplified beyond the reality of it. And it, in many ways, cro- sits alongside the partisan divisions, which are constantly nurtured and fostered uh, through media outlets. And people, you get sort of an egoic boast, uh, sort of egoic boost to say, well, you know, I'm good, I follow it, but these people over there are not good, and they're stupid, and they're not doing these things, how could they be so so foolish? But in reality, it serves to sort of deflect our attention from the real systemic, uh, the systemic causes of our problems. Because we are, the United States is a very rich country, it has huge resources to bear. Regardless, even if some number of people do not cooperate with social distancing, we should be able to get this under control. But we're, since we're all focused on fighting each other across this partisan divide, we're not able to actually, you know, confront that, and we it exacerbates our own divisions. And you know, we get a sort of a uh, self-congratulatory uh, sort of boost out of it by saying we're good compared to those people. But it actually we miss the core problem, which is that the government failed to deal with this, and our public health sector is, you know, starved for resources it needs to deal with a disease like this. Yeah, I think it's the journalist uh, Jane Coaston, a uh, fantastic reporter at Vox, who has this uh, term she calls thing-adjacent discourse, which is when there's a really big uh, problem or issue being debated, such as how do we reckon with the legacy of uh, white supremacy in America, and then people start getting obsessed with whether or not they're going to tear down, uh, hypothetically, monuments to George Washington, right? That is a way of sucking all the attention into a, an intramural debate that fits into nice, healthy, extreme partisan lines so that we aren't actually talking about the real issue, which is what everyone was actually trying to bring up in the first place. Um, and I think we see that a lot. I think social media facilitates that in various ways. I think Twitter facilitates that. I think in part, uh, Twitter also misleads us into thinking that these are actually serious, salient debates, whereas Many people on social media will argue about tearing down George Washington's statue and can spend all day doing that sort of thing and trolling each other about it. The average American is absolutely not thinking about that, and they're actually not on Twitter. 22% of American adults are on Twitter, and everyone else is not. But the average American is not even as tuned into politics as you or me. They're trying to put food on the table. They're trying to take care of their children. They're trying to make sure they have a job. They're trying to figure out um, where their income is coming from. Like These are like much, much more salient concerns. Um, but social media and its very small pocket of people that it represents, and it's not a nothing pocket, it's an important pocket. It's a constituency, say, it's one fifth of America, let's say, right? But it's only one fifth and it only represents the people who are on it, right? To mistake that for the whole conversation and to mistake that for all of the important things uh, is a problem. And it's also a problem when uh, it completely misleads us as to what the real reality is, like you mentioned, when it comes to masks. Because if you paid attention to only the cable news and Twitter, you would think that there's this real bitter civil war going on in America over masks instead of 70% of Americans saying, I think you should wear a mask. Um, but people on these sorts of outlets are paid and incentivized to polarize. That is their job. If Donald Trump says the sky is purple, there is an army of people whose job it is to say that the sky is purple. And then there's an counter army that's supposed to not just say it's not purple, but to laugh performatively at all the people who think it's purple. And then we just keep having that conversation. When you go and ask average Americans, like, well, it's obviously blue. Are we even talking about this? Um, and so like very often, that is often how I feel social media conversations and debates unfold totally disconnected from the conversations that Americans are having. You know, one of my favorite books ever is this book by Neil Postman called Amusing Ourselves to Death. And the thesis of that book, which was actually written before the Internet age, was that the bias of visual media is very strongly towards entertainment. And I find Donald Trump is very much the apex of this thesis because He's not a good manager, he's not a good politician, he's not a good person in my opinion, but he is extremely, undeniably very entertaining. And he was an entertainer before he became a politician. He's very charismatic in his very unconventional way. He has been in the news every single day since 2015, just by being more provocative, the most uh, outlandish individual he can be, which makes for very good media. It makes for a very polarizing and outrageous debate on news every night. As you said, there's armies of people who have been institutionalized to argue either point of whatever he says at any given moment. A guy who does not think about what he says that much, to be honest with you, but he's able to make us all think about it. And, you know, it 
is very entertaining, but it includes the very serious structural issues that we're all dealing with. We have a country to run, we have an environment to, you know, hopefully save. And you know, you mentioned this the thing adjacent discourse, and a lot of the we were all dealing with this shared experience of the pandemic, and then when George Floyd was killed by the police officer in Minnesota in late May. The dam sort of burst, and all these other tensions which were building up during the period and heightening during that period. And I think that George Floyd is a very tragic case, was very emblematic of several different things. He was a victim of, uh, it appears to be racism, uh, being targeted by the police as a black man in the United States, and a long systemic history of racism in the U.S. He was poor, he's from an economic underclass, and he also had COVID-19. Uh, he was found out after the point, point of his death he was infected with the virus. So he was really the victim of these very serious and deadly unaddressed social pathologies and his death should cause us to focus on those pathologies, those three things, poverty, racism, and now the disease and lack of access to health care that is a shared experience of many people in the United States. But now we've been diverted somehow, I don't think on purpose, but just by the logic of the medium to talking about things which are one degree of separation, two, three degrees of separation, somehow triggered by that event, but have left him far behind and people like him far behind because of the fact it goes on a logic of entertainment and what's fun to talk about or what gets more mileage out of it. Because people, these systemic issues, there's a sense of helplessness in some points, but also the sense of, well, let's talk about what we can talk about is how we don't like the people over there. And let's fight with them. And that makes good copy. That makes good TV. Is there a way in the digital media age to sort of negate that or to sort of get that under control? And to the extent you could, how could we do that? It's a really hard question. So, you know, something I, I think about a lot. Um, I do think that uh, teaching ourselves to use social media rather than be used by it is where everything starts. Um, uh, I think you said to this before, which is that um, all of these technologies sort of just were foisted upon us. We didn't choose uh, these technologies. They were created, and then we were sort of uh, foisted into a world shaped by them uh, without really any sort of conscious assent, without any sort of democratic deliberation. And suddenly we are just living lives mediated by Facebook, Twitter, and so on. And then the pandemic comes, and now they're entirely mediated by these things. Um, and that is something that we didn't really consciously think through. Uh, and like any other technology, social media is not inherently evil or good. It's as good or bad as the people who use it. And so we need to start thinking about how do you train people to use these things better? How do you train people to be better and to reflect fewer of their flaws onto our social media discourse? Um, and so sometimes you might be having a very, I, I talk to students on college campuses or back when I went to college campuses and they would ask me, oh, you deal with a tremendous amount of say anti-Semitic trolls and other sorts of vitriolic content. How do you cope? And I said, part of the way you cope is by learning what social media and what different platforms are and aren't good for and recognizing when it's worthwhile to respond and when it's not and in what ways. Uh, so you're not going to solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict on Twitter. It's not a thing that's going to happen. Right. If you know, if you want to do that, you know, head over to Snapchat, much better medium. Not really. Um, Facebook, you know, is better in that you can put in a few more words. Right. You have a little more time. But Facebook is also, to a certain extent, public, just like Twitter is. And when you're arguing in front of an audience, you're less likely to admit you're wrong. Right. Or to genuinely reconsider your positions because you're worried about losing face in front of other people. So maybe if you want to have a serious conversation about a difficult issue, you want to have that on the phone or face to face or you want to have it by email. Um, and then there are other things which are perfectly suited to something like Twitter or something like Facebook or Snapchat or Instagram or TikTok, right? And understanding what each medium is good for and what it's not um, will help us to have more productive conversations. And so, you know, teaching people to use the internet rather than letting the internet use them, I think can go a long way. You know, we're all in living through this pandemic and we're all under varying levels of psychological and emotional stress. And... Sometime a few months ago, we all had this shared experience of watching this very terrible, uh, provocative and horrifying unjust murder of somebody in Minnesota by a police officer. And that event, it sort of burst a dam of many emotional and uh, spiritual pain that people were going through for reasons connected to racial injustice, but also encompassing the general you know, societal and economic breakdown we're all going through. 
when you saw that, I know you're somebody who looks at things some, oftentimes from a religious perspective, from the Jewish tradition. So I was curious, when you see the outbreak of this movement, how do you contextualize it in previous revolutionary or even what some would say religious movements? And how would you feel to people who say that this has a religious connotation to it, uh, the response of people to this very uh, egregious and tragic murder? Yeah, so I mean, I think it was Matt Iglesias who coined the term the Great Awakening, uh, which is a takeoff on the Great Awakening, which was a religious arrival in America. And many commentators have pointed out sort of different parallels between uh, the social justice uh, activism we see today and religious movements. Uh, I think a lot of times, not always, um, like Matt Iglesias wasn't doing it this way, but many people point that out as a criticism uh, and arguing that this is some sort of, uh, you know, unthinking movement. Uh, you know, and they understand religion thus in a pejorative sense. But you look at someone like me and you, we both come from strong religious traditions. We value what religion uh, brings to life. I think religion is one of the most powerful forces for organizing human beings uh, for good and for noble causes and can inspire great acts of uh, moral courage and heroism. Uh, and so when I see the religious valence to something like this, um, I see positive things. Um, I see, you know, positive echoes of the civil rights movement, which was, of course, shot through with religion. It was read by Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, you cannot really separate the civil rights movement, in fact, from religion. Um, and so it does feel like there's a certain religious energy in society that's being channeled through it. Uh, but I don't see that necessarily as a negative. I do think it can help us understand when you get excesses from the movement or things that seem to go too far, as people might say. Um, that makes perfect sense to me also because, of course, as someone who comes from a religious tradition, I'm very familiar with the concept of religious extremism and the fact that religions are prone uh, to certain excesses or flaws uh, if they are not carefully watched and preserved. Um, and it's like one, one example that sometimes you see uh, in certain sub-communities of the social justice movement is the tendency to treat certain, say, anti-racist books or arguments as religious texts to be accepted rather than intellectual texts, right, important intellectual texts to be engaged with, argued with, and grappled with, right? So when I go to college and I'm handed Karl Marx and Sigmund Freud and Simone de Beauvoir, right, you're not handed that and said, you must accept every word in this as God's truth, right? You're supposed to think for yourself and say, well, this makes sense to me, this doesn't, and then discuss it with other people, see if you're right, see if you're wrong, and then come to a greater understanding. Um, but in a more extreme religious context, you are not allowed to argue with the text, right? The text is authoritative, and if you disagree with any aspect of it, you are either misunderstanding the text, or you are wrong, or you are a heretic. And again, this is not the entirety of the social justice movement, but you can see, say, the initial sort of way, say, Robin DiAngelo's book, White Fragility, was treated, it was sort of this totemic thing that you hold up on Instagram, and like, I'm getting religion, I read the good book, right, and now I am saved. Um, and it wasn't like I'm reading this and I'm having a debate with the author and I'm trying to better myself, but also I, I come to it with my own understandings and opinions. Um, and that's that's a very different relationship with the text. I don't know if that's what Robin D'Angelo intended for her book, you know, to be read as, right? But that's often like how I sometimes see it or people feel that way. They feel they can't criticize the book. They're in a training that's based around a text like White Fragility uh, in their company. And I've heard this from people as a journalist and they feel they cannot say, I disagree with this part. Right, that they're not allowed to do it. That's a fundamentalist outlook, right, towards uh, towards the text. That's treating this book as a religious text, and I don't think that's healthy because I think the way we get to better understandings is by reading incredibly powerful arguments and testimonies, and then grappling with them, and then criticizing them, and then reading the responses to the criticism, and perfecting our ideas and understanding. And there's no way that Robert D'Angelo can make her ideas better, or say Ibrahim X. Kendi can make his ideas better if people are afraid to criticize and fully engage with it. Right. And these are clearly, I think, whatever you think of their politics, very, very brilliant people. Right. And we would benefit from having a high level conversation about their ideas and arguing them out at the highest level. Uh, but I think that some people and in, in some respects, uh, and again, this is only in sub sub communities. We're having this conversation right now. Obviously, there isn't some totalitarian umbrella preventing us from talking about these things. There is simply this perception. And it is the case in certain communities and in certain parts of the Internet. Where, or in a context of like a corporate room where you're being trained, where people feel they can't engage with the text this way. Um, we, it's just gonna require someone like me and someone like you to sometimes say, that thing makes me super uncomfortable. I think it's egregiously wrong and profoundly offensive. And also the person has a right to say it because otherwise we cannot you know, have 
you know, political freedom in this country. And we aren't going to be free to actually, uh, you know, learn from our mistakes and, you know, and basically get better. Um, I'd make an analogy to uh, there's a dispute in the Talmud. Um, they, uh, they ask, why did the Talmud preserve, or it might be the Mishnah, I forget, I think it might be in the Mishnah, why did the rabbis preserve um, incorrect opinions? Because, of course, Jewish legal texts are full of people arguing, rabbis arguing with each other, and sometimes they then say, and this is the correct opinion, right? The halakha, the law, is like this rabbi. So then why on earth did they preserve the guy who was wrong? Why is the Talmud filled with wrong opinions? And one of the answers they give is so that in case it turns out that that person ends up being right, whether now or in the future, right, we have it preserved, right? And so the idea is, is that sometimes wrong opinions are either wrong in their time but could be right down the line, or the law was wrongly decided and we discover that later. You know, you make a very good point that it's often when you refer to something as a religion, it's referred to as a pejorative, but it's not necessarily a pejorative. And their you know, communism, in the sense, is a complex of meaning and uh, directives. Uh, it has had religious components, uh, liberal liberalism, has very many influences of Christianity and so forth. So when people refer to, I guess we don't, I would say that probably what's going on right now is an expansion of the prerogatives of liberalism, but some people have argued that it's uh, another step beyond liberalism or successor to it. But certainly uh, to refer to it as a religion is not a, to denigrate it. It's to say that people, it's an outlet for people's energies and spiritual and emotional energies and so forth. And in some ways it's like, there's two types of, uh, I guess you can call it distinct religiosities. There's one, the, the old one, which is tied to old religions like uh, the Islam and Judaism, Christianity and the Hinduism and so forth. And there's a sort of a new sort of this-worldly religion, which arguably started with the French Revolution, which is very focused on establishing a certain sort of order on earth. And you could say the order, the ultimate teleology of it aims towards the equality of all people. And how that's defined can be different in certain certain aspects or how the power dynamics or the divisions are defined could be different but it's sort of geared towards that and I see that this movement for social justice and social change is very much in the French revolutionary tradition because it's aimed at establishing equality and but you know it is like it also is a channel for people's excess spiritual and emotional energy and a lot of people I think it was mentioned it was 25 million people went out in the streets to protest uh, after the killing of George Floyd and as you see, a lot of people, some of them were very focused on several key policies that they wanted to change, or they were explicitly aimed at the interests of the African American community in the United States, or extending the legacy of the civil rights movement. But also, there were much, many other issues which people brought to the fore related to uh, gender inequalities or uh, economic inequalities, which have been exacerbated by the pandemic. I, you know, it's historically it's been the case that. Uh, scenarios of extreme social trauma, including disease outbreaks, have given rise to these great uh, spiritual outpourings. I want to know, do you see this outpouring that we've seen as somehow with some analogies historically? So, I mean, as a, as a Jewish reporter who reports on anti-Semitism, I have a cynical response to that, which is that whenever you have these sorts of plagues or revolutions, somebody always lands on the Jews as part of the problem. And we've certainly seen certain, you know, uh, expressions of anti-Semitism uh, recently um, in terms of, you know, all sorts of stuff coming from, you know, athletes and celebrities and other things. Um, there were also, there have been conspiracy uh, theorists who have tried to blame the coronavirus on Rothschilds, on Jews, on Israel. Um, so definitely see that particular parallel. Of course, the Black Death, most famously, they accused the Jews of poisoning the wells. Right? So this is something that's not too far, I think, from many Jews' consciousness uh, at these sorts of times of upheaval. Um, but of course, they're also, you know, again, as you said, they can also cause uh, just a general reappraisal within society of uh, the previous structures and the way we understood things um, and saying, you know, things are broken, they aren't working. Um, why is that? And then then people offer different answers. And some of those answers are really positive and constructive. And some of those are negative and destructive and, you know, work on, you know, finding scapegoats. Right. So Jews end up being in that category. Um, but there are also people who then say, well, no, in fact, look at like today, look at our material circumstances, all these people who can't afford health care, all of these people who are either unemployed or underemployed, um, an economic system that is, you know, built around 
I would put it this way, right? This is not how everyone else is talking. Uh, built around a capitalism that lifted a tremendous number of people out of poverty and revolutionized the world, but has been yielding for some time diminishing returns. Um, and at what point do you start acknowledging that you that those returns have diminished and try to come up with something better um, and try to, uh, you know, reform you know, Bernie would use the word revolutionize. I think one of the things that has actually hurt his ability to reach a broader audience is that he's always cast um, his uh, call in terms of revolution when he's really calling for evolution from a capitalist democracy to a social democratic uh, society. Uh, it's not as big a lift as he makes it out to be. Um, and I think a lot of people are recognizing that, which is why you have this sort of large consensus uh, when it comes to a lot of these protests um, and significant consensus on a whole bunch of issues, whether it's climate change or police reform. You, If you just ignore what happens on social media and cable news and the people who are paid to have politically polarizing arguments and say represent Donald Trump, you have very large majorities of Americans who have uh, consensus on important issues, uh, which is why someone like Joe Biden is having a relatively easy time of it, because uh, he just takes the popular stance on a whole bunch of issues. Um, you know, just say, I want to fight climate change. Most people do. Um, this isn't just, you know, Democrats. Um, you say, I want to reform the police. There is uh, too much uh, violence being enacted uh, towards minority communities by law enforcement. We need to do this better. We need to change how we do policing. Again, most people agree with that. Um, I think we lose sight of this. This brings us back to this other part of our conversation, which is Twitter represents real people. It represents the 22% of American adults who are on Twitter. But those people are not the rest of America. And disproportionately, they are people um, who are very strong, politically uh, radicalized individuals, with like, like us, <laughs> right? I'm not accepting myself from that. People who pay tremendous attention to politics, who have very strong opinions on all sorts of issues. Um, whereas most Americans are not on Twitter, right, and have far more important things pressing on their minds, like putting food on the table, holding down a job, taking care of ill family members or insecure um, neighbors, uh, these sorts of things. And they're not thinking about all the stuff that Twitter's thinking about, and they're not aligning with one team or another. And a lot of things that seem like common sense to them are not common sense on Twitter. So you have people telling you on Twitter that masks are terrible and a concession to, I don't know, unmanliness or something like that. Um, and this is sort of what like, you know, Trump Twitter was for quite some time. But then we look at the polls and it shows you that 70% of Americans think you should be wearing a mask or say they are wearing a mask. Uh, that's just totally different than the reality you see on social media. And the ability for us to separate what we see online and recognize that that's part of reality, but it's not the whole reality. And sometimes it can be the reverse of reality is a really, again, important thing that we start training ourselves to do. Uh, and politicians and those in power and organizations and corporations need to look at social media as one constituency rather than the whole constituency. You know, it's so interesting because a lot of this discourse about people not wearing masks the degree to which it's been portrayed as the core issue that's driving the pandemic and how that differentiates from the actual fact most people are wearing masks and it's not the big cultural issue that is going to have to be in the press, not just in social media, but in cable news as well too. It's very much geared towards building the ego of certain camps, like one, the right-wing camp or the left-wing camp, you could say, that you know the other bad people are responsible for this issue and they're the ones who they're through their sheer stupidity or or uh, insensibility are causing this disease that's crippling the country when in reality the core issue is that there's a lack of state capacity in the united states the public health capacity to deal with this pandemic was underfunded and uh, essentially uh, starved of resources for years and years and most americans are cooperating they're trying to do the best to mitigate the pandemic to not spread the disease, social distance, wear masks, and so forth. It's really a state failure. And the state failure is being redirected into more internecine conflict between Americans, more sectarian conflict. Uh, you, sometimes you see the deliberate fomenting of sectarian divisions in society in cases when governments have failed to govern as they should. And I think the core, there, there are ethnic and racial divisions in American society which are very salient, but there's also a hugely salient division between two ideological camps, the left-wing, you could say, camp and the right-wing camp, and there are further breakdowns within them. But it's fine. People increasingly are looking to the news, it seems, for a validation or more egoic uh, building of themselves at the expense of a theoretical other. And it's not clear if people are even talking to each other. Because, you know, we 
there's very little communication across ideological bounds to see if these assumptions are actually correct. In many cases, that they're not correct. Yeah, imagine you had people whose job it was was to scout out the other political side and find out, do they really think all the crazy things uh, that I think they think, that I'm told they think? Um, you would find sometimes the answer is yes, right? But a lot of times the answer is no, and then we just have much more productive conversations. Um, I, I, I'm reminded by, you know, things, you know, something that happened on social media just today um, that sort of illustrates this. When you start living in this sort of, um, you know, silo uh, among only people who think the same things and believe the same things about the other side, you become actually much more susceptible to misinformation about the other side and in general to misinformation that plays to your partisan biases. And in a very humorous, low stakes way that this played out today was um, a professional uh, left-wing troll uh, set up a site called braverthanourtroops.org, which purported to be an official Antifa website. Uh, and so the idea is here's an Antifa recruitment website, and it's called Braver Than Our Troops. And obviously it's a satire. He was trying to get outraged reactions from stupid right-wing trolls, right? He's like, how many right-wingers can I trigger by creating this Antifa site uh, that makes them out to be braver than our troops? Um, and as a little Easter egg, he put into the source code of the website um, you know, created for, you know, Ben Shapiro, editor of the Daily Wire, here's his email address. Uh, so to imply, not only, right, you know, not just create this hoax site, but then if you looked into it, you might look at it and, you know, say, oh, and Ben Shapiro created this hoax site, or this right wing commentator. Now, he just threw that in as a, as a sort of, you know, offhand joke. Someone, you know, on left wing Twitter discovered this site, and then discovered uh, the source code that seemed to suggest that Ben Shapiro may have created this fake Antifa site. And then they said, oh, Ben Shapiro, he fear mongers about Antifa, but really he's creating fake Antifa websites so you can fear monger about them, which is, of course, not what happened, right? This site, therefore, that was designed to uh, deceive right wingers ended up deceiving left wingers. And it went insanely viral among left wingers attacking Ben Shapiro for creating this site that Ben Shapiro clearly did not create, that was clearly intended as satire. But because again, you live in this sort of cave where the other people outside are all horrific, stupid troglodytes, you could never conceive, right, that they wouldn't have done something this dumb, right, that this is this is a little bit crazy. Um, and so that sort of thing, and it got so bad that the creator of the site had to out himself and say, I created it, Ben Shapiro didn't create it. Um, you know, folks should not be sharing this as though that's actually what happened. Um, and I think that uh, we should be wary of anything on social media that seems so perfectly crafted to manipulate us through our partisan biases. Because if it seems too good to be true, it often is. Now, with the caveat that in the Trump era, it's gotten harder to tell, no question. I think that's part of what this is, right? It's harder to tell the difference between a New York Times headline and an Onion headline more and more in the current environment, but it's still possible, right? And if people still had real relationships and lines to the other side, they would be able to have a better sense of what is and what isn't. Yeah, this is exactly, well, I guess this is kind of meta for the conversation, but it's why I want to, want to talk to you as well too, because we have political differences, but we have a constructive conversation about them. And the thing is, you can find that a lot of your differences, the ones you can d see what the real ones are from the imaginary ones once you talk. Yeah. And I know that you've, like with Rasha Tlaib, you debunked some uh, false information about her publicly, and she thanked you, I remember, in the past, too, for doing yeah. that. Because even to the people who we have differences with, including very serious ones, if we have to deal with some sense of fairness, because we're all descending into this sort of digital, very high-tech dark age with... You know, heretics and the saved and, you know, new tools with which to, uh, you know, anathematize uh, each other. And the same with Ben Shapiro, the same, I disagree with Ben Shapiro about 99% of things. But we, if we don't extend the same sort of uh, rationality and fairness to our opponents, then we're in a very dangerous zero-sum sort of uh, situation. And furthermore, it's very productive to somebody that all these very pointless and... Uh, circular fights are going on, this extension of energy is going on. And a lot of this discourse, the journalistic discourse, and I would say you know, a lot of the, the dis debates have been happening the last month or so uh, online and among journalists and thinkers, they've been among people who are very high up on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Like There are people who are way lower, who don't have access to these platforms, and their needs are very important, but they don't even have the ability to get them aired up. People, as you said earlier, who having trouble putting food on the table. There's a huge eviction crisis impending. 
uh, people who are lacking in the United States access to health care in the richest, most powerful country in the world. They have access to decent health care. And the fact that so much energy is being expended on these sectarian battles, it's preventing the energy which could be directed at addressing the needs of those people who are much more dire straits. And I, it feels like almost like it's a setup. It feels like it's almost like being egged on because it does divert all this energy because it's not actually accomplishing anything, these sectarian conflicts most of the time, but it is certainly sucking up the attention of people who do have relatively more power to address um, some of these social problems which are at the base of society. Yeah, I mean, I just always notice the difference between uh, tweets that I make about things that I consider sometimes to be important and how much pickup they'll get and tweets that I make that are about something that happened on Twitter, which invariably gets vastly more pickup uh, because Twitter loves to talk about itself, right? We all have to talk about ourselves. The internet loves to talk about itself. It's a little secret that a lot of journalistic outlets understand, which is writing an article about a conflagration on Twitter will get a lot of hits because all of the people on Twitter want to read about themselves. And so this creates this sort of feedback loop where we have this entire discourse around things and controversies that aren't necessarily the most important ones, as you said, and sometimes, as I said, in terms of representation, are not even real, right? Just because somebody, for example, could get, a, you know, like a white high schooler can get a grand total of, you know, 1,500 people to sign a change.org petition complaining that certain products in Trader Joe's are labeled with racist labels, right? Now, 1,500 signatures in change.org terms is like getting, you know, I don't know, 200 retweets, right? It is really not that hard to do. It doesn't mean anything, right? But then you have a company that then has to res respond to it because the New York Times and CNN and many other outlets decided this was a story, right? But it wasn't. Right. And again, it's not the high school kids fault. It's the news outlets fault for not being able to distinguish single and noise. Right. What is significant and what is not. And then sucking up our attention around something that isn't really uh, the issue. Well, thanks a lot, man. Thanks for speaking. It was uh, great. We had a good conversation as always. And hopefully people can see this and see that hey, it's possible for us to talk. And it's actually very constructive.